Amen. Amen. Thanks, David. And we are so excited for you and Shannon with the birth of Jordan. That's just an amazing thing. So uh, we celebrate with you. Well, uh, welcome everyone to Christmas services here at Frontline 2021. If you're watching with us online, it's great to have you joining in with us as well. And so from my family to your family, I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Uh, This is kind of a special year, a special Christmas for my family and I, because this year, this Christmas marks 20 Christmases that we have been at Frontline, that we've been able to celebrate Christmas with all of you and our Frontline family. Um, So that's just an awesome thing. Yeah. That's really meaningful for us. And in fact, this is uh, what my family looks like now. Um, So this is my wife, Carrie. Uh, my beautiful wife and our boys. This is Aaron and Alan and John and Andrew. And crazy enough, 20 years ago, 20 Christmases ago, we only had this guy. We only had Alan. He was the only one that was born. And now they're absolutely huge, and they're all in my house right now uh, over Christmas Christmas break. In fact, if you're looking for a last-minute gift idea for me, cereal, lots and lots of cereal. I don't understand, but they just eat boxes and boxes of cereal all the time, cereal. Anybody else have teenage boys? You know what I'm talking about? Like they just constantly devour the cereal. Um, So this is a special year for us, and it just feels uh, special to be celebrating with all of you. If this is your first time uh, part of this celebration with Frontline, welcome to the family. If it's been your first time in a while or joining in with us online, uh, welcome back. Uh, It's great to have you with us. What we're doing tonight is we are wrapping up a series we've been working through where we've been talking about Christmas scandals. So we're looking at Matthew's gospel. Matthew begins his gospel story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection with a genealogy, a a boring list of names, or so it would seem. It's this long list of, of names in Jesus' family history. And what we've been realizing is that Matthew intentionally includes some scandalous stories, some scandalous people with scandalous stories in his family. Maybe you have some stories of scandal in your family or in your background. And so we've looked at names like Ruth and Rahab. Uh, We've looked at names like Tamar and Bathsheba. And tonight what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the final two scandalous names in Jesus' genealogy, in his family history. The final two scandalous names are Mary and Joseph. And we're going to look at Mary and Joseph's story and uh, just see what it says to us about who Jesus is and what he came to do and what we're celebrating tonight. So this is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is what it says about uh, Mary and Joseph. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly So he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, a unmarried teenage pregnancy and a broken engagement would be a scandal in any century, in any time period in history, and in any culture. But if I could, I'd love to give you just a little bit more background on specifically what Mary and Joseph were living in. So they lived in the first century in Judea. And so Mary would have been about 14 or 15 years old, believe it or not, at the time of this story, which would have been marrying age for Jewish women at this time. Now, her engagement to Joseph would have been arranged for her by her family. She would have, she would have had no choice in the matter. So this wasn't like this romantic, loving story, you know. This is a, an arranged marriage that would have been basically about what was best for her family and what was best for his family. And she was going to have to go along with it. Now, they lived in Nazareth. Mary lived in Nazareth. And Nazareth, at this time in the first century, was an extremely poor town. Uh, We think somewhere around 400 people lived in Nazareth. So it's this small town. Everyone knows everyone. It's very poor. Um, Some estimates are that 70% of the people who lived in Nazareth were peasant farmers, which was a very poor way to make a living. But to make matters even worse... All of the people in Nazareth would have been subject to the taxes of Rome at this time, oppressive, brutal taxation. Some scholars think like somewhere between 80 to 90% of people's incomes, if you're already poor, are being taken and you've got no choice in the matter. You have to do it. So Mary, I would just describe Mary as a valley person. That's what she was. In other words, Mary was a person who knew what it felt like to wrestle with darkness that was outside of her control. 
Mary and Joseph both knew what it felt like to be under the thumb of the empire, to be on the underside of power, to, and to wrestle with, with forces of darkness that were frankly just felt overwhelming and completely out of their control. And, and all I want to do tonight is I just want to kind of look at Mary specifically, and I just want our, us to see ourselves a little bit in her, if we could, because um, we're a lot like Mary. Maybe, maybe you don't think you are. Maybe you don't think your situation is much like Mary. But I would tell you one of the reasons that Mary is in Matthew's gospel and one of the reasons we look at her story is because we're supposed to see ourselves a little bit in Mary. And so a couple of key ways, two key ways that we are like Mary. First of all, we all wrestle with darkness beyond our control. Every one of us in this last year has wrestled with darkness beyond our control. And the second thing is we all have a plan for our own salvation from that darkness. The first of all, we all wrestle with darkness beyond our control. Every one of us. It's different for different ones of us. Maybe for you, it was the company that laid you off this past year when the pandemic hit. Uh, maybe it was the legal system that awarded custody after the divorce. Maybe that's your darkness that feels out of your control. Maybe it's a cancer diagnosis. Uh, maybe it's the way the pandemic has affected our lives. Um, this past week, I've been talking with several just different frontline uh, families who this year, they're dealing with an empty chair at their Christmas table. Uh, maybe it's the ways in which your family has become divided over all these issues and all these things that have happened. And frankly, it just feels like uh, things have just gotten darker. Does it feel like to anyone it's gotten darker over the last couple of years? We, we feel this, don't we? We wrestle, every single one of us, it's different for each one of us, but we wrestle with darkness beyond our control, and we all have a plan for our own salvation from that darkness. What do I mean by that? What, what I mean by that is all of us have something that we're trying to fix ourselves with. We all have some way that we're trying to gain control or salvation from that darkness that, that we deal with. So maybe for you, it's work. Work more hours, get a bigger paycheck, achieve more, buy more things, and then, then that'll make me feel like I'm enough. That'll fix me. Maybe for some of us, it's beauty, physical fitness. You know, to be a beauty that's admired by others, to work out and work out and work out and, and get more and more comments and likes online. And then if, I, if people say I'm beautiful, then maybe that will make me feel good about myself. That'll fix me. For some of us, it's family. That's our plan for our salvation. That's our plan for how to fix the things that feel out of our control of our lives. We have this script we play out in our heads. If I, I'll get married and then we'll have kids and that'll fix everything. And then what happens is when we can't get married or when the divorce happens or when infidelity hits and we can't have kids the way we thought or you know, when, the, when our job fires us, whatever it is, when these things break down, it causes chaos. It causes absolute just devastation in our lives because that was the thing that we were hanging our hope on. That was the thing that we were counting on to fix what was broken in our lives. What's amazing about this story is that Joseph has a plan for how to save himself, right? He has a plan for how to fix the situation he's in. What was it? He's going to break the engagement with Mary. Now, that, that sounds really harsh, right? When we hear it, it's like, man, seriously, you're just going to abandon her right in the middle of this time? But in actuality, this would have been the honorable thing to do in this culture at this time. Joseph is literally trying to fix the situation. He's trying to, uh, you know, in, in the, as most honoring a way he possibly can, in a way that doesn't bring disgrace on Mary, he's trying to break the engagement so they can both kind of move on quietly. They're in a town of 400 people. Everybody knows. Everybody's talking. And, and so this is his plan for how to fix it. But that wasn't God's plan. And, and thank God it wasn't God's plan. Because... What we see here in what happens in the next few verses we're about to read together is that God had an invitation for Joseph in the midst of this situation, in the midst of this darkness that fell completely out of his control. God had an invitation for him. And I would tell you in these next verses we're going to read that God also has an invitation for you tonight, for you and for me and for every single one of us. If you're watching online, he has an invitation for you in these words. Let's look at this together. 
It says, as he considered this, as Joseph considered breaking the engagement, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will, and let's just say this last line together, save his people from their sins. So Jesus comes as God's plan of salvation. It's not Joseph's plan of salvation. Joseph had a different plan, but, he, God, but God brings Jesus into this situation, and Jesus is God's plan for salvation for Mary and Joseph in the situation that they're in. But I would say, in a larger way, when we look at the entire story of Scripture, the entire story of, of humanity, Jesus was God's plan of salvation for it all to bring reconciliation, to bring salvation from the entire story that the Bible tells. There's a uh, picture that has gotten a whole lot of traction online. Uh, over the last few years, it's been getting passed around again and again. How many of you have seen this picture? Uh, some of you, okay, a lot of you haven't. So uh, this was a work of art that was originally done several years ago by a nun, actually, and it was never intended to be circulated around, but it's kind of made the rounds and become, uh, a, a, you know, something that, that a lot of people have seen. And it's such a powerful image because in one image, it tells the big story of the Bible, the big story of us, of humanity. And so what you have right here on the left is you have Eve, the mother of all creation. Uh, God, in the beginning, the Bible opens with God uh, creating the heavens and, and the earth, and he creates Adam and Eve to live in um, harmony with himself and with creation. And you see here, Eve is clutching this piece of fruit with a bite out of it. Because what Eve did is she basically, the way she decided she was going to fix her situation or get control over her situation is she decided she was going to take God's place. And so she takes a bite of the fruit. Sin enters our world. And, you know, it says that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. So if I, if I were to give just a simple definition of sin, sin is basically any way in our lives that we seek to take God's place. It's any way in our lives that we seek to fix ourselves with something, to take God's place in our lives. And, and that's what Eve did. But notice she's got her hand on the pregnant belly of Mary. It's all, there's almost this desperation to this picture, isn't there? And... If sin is any way in which we try to take God's place, salvation could be defined as God taking our place. That through Jesus, and Jesus came through Mary, God basically brings a perfect atoning sacrifice that Jesus willingly offered his life in our place and a sacrificial death so that we could be reunited to God. In fact, the name Jesus actually means salvation. It means God saves. Now, here's the thing about uh, this picture. A whole lot of you already know that story. Many of you in this room, many of you watching online right now, you grew up hearing that story. I can show you this picture, and you didn't even need the explanation I just gave you over the last couple minutes here. You already know what that picture means. You can see it. You even know what the snake means wrapped around her foot, but it's being crushed by her heel. You, you already know the story. But here's the thing, just because you know the story doesn't mean anything has actually happened in your life as a result. Because a lot of us, you can know the story, you can know the information, but Jesus came to be a savior because we needed to be saved. He's, you know, you can look at him as a teacher. A lot of people talk about him, he was a great teacher. He was a great philosopher. He was a, a righteous person. He lived a, a good life, a moral life, and all those things are true. But the Bible calls Jesus a savior because we needed to be saved. It's, it's kind of like this light bulb here. You know, this light bulb, just because it has the mechanisms that can, that can shine light, nothing actually happens with this light bulb. It has no power within itself to turn on. You can sit here and flip the switch all you want. Nothing is going to happen for this light bulb until it is connected to a power source outside of itself. And that's when the light comes on. A whole lot of us, it's like we're walking around with this light bulb. We know the story. We know the information. We know what that picture means. We understand all the details. But, we're, we're, but personally, experientially, we haven't experienced the person of Jesus. We haven't plugged into 
the power source outside of ourselves, which is Jesus. Jesus came to be that for our world and for us. And so what happens is nothing really changes in our lives until we personally connect to the person of Jesus Christ, until we know him personally. And so how do we do that? How do we actually take that step? How do we connect ourselves into the person of Jesus? The simplest way I know to describe it is just we, we have to come to this place where we surrender our plan of salvation so that we can accept his plan. His plan was Jesus. Whatever it is that you're trying to fix yourself with, what you, we all know what it's like to wrestle with darkness outside of our control. And every single one of us has some kind of a plan for how we're going to fix ourselves or how we're going to save ourselves from that darkness. The invitation of the gospel is to surrender your plan of salvation. The fancy word that Jesus used for that was repent. Repent. It means to turn around, to basically surrender the way that you're trying to fix yourself, the way that you're trying to save yourself, the way that you're trying to make yourself good enough from all these things that feel overwhelming in your life, and so that you can actually accept his plan of salvation, so that you can accept him. That's what we're invited to do, so that he can come into your life, so that he can be your Lord, so that the light bulb can come on, so that he can become the power source by which you live your life. So, why don't people do that? Why do we hear that message again and again and again? And for so many of us, why don't we ever get to that point where the light bulb actually comes on? And we continue carrying around the light bulb. We know the story, but we aren't experiencing it personally in our day-to-day lives. Why does that happen? Here, here's why I think it happens. The reason I think we don't plug in to Jesus, why we don't invite him into our lives personally, is because we hear the gospel message. And for so many of us, we say to ourselves, well... Yeah, but you know, if I become a Christian, that means I'm going to have to forgive my sister-in-law. Well, if that were true, then the gospel message we're celebrating would be Jesus plus a forgiving heart is what equals salvation. But that's not the gospel. That's not what the message is. We, we hear it and we think, well, yeah, I'd love to become a Christian, but you know, if I become a Christian, I'm going to have to stop sleeping with my girlfriend. Well, if that were true, then the gospel message would be Jesus plus sexual purity equals salvation. But that's not the gospel message, is it? The message of the gospel, the message that we're given at Christmas time and that we celebrate is Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing, that he himself is sufficient. Mary and Joseph brought nothing to the equation except their willingness to say yes to his plan. You can't clean yourself up in order to come to Jesus. Okay, that's like putting on your makeup so you can jump in the bath. The the language for faith, the language for this that we use around here at Frontline, we've talked about many, many times over the years, is this idea that faith, the language of faith is yes before how. How? We say yes to Jesus. We say yes to being plugged into the power source of Jesus in our lives. And then we don't worry about the how. We let him do the heavy lifting. We let him become Lord of our lives. And we begin to follow him. We begin to let him clean up the things that only he can clean up. Because if we could do it on our own power, we'd be doing it. But we can't. The gospel message is Jesus plus nothing. It's a move of saying yes. And I'll entrust him with the how. Whatever that means on the other side of it. When you do that, when you come to a place where where you actually invite Jesus, you surrender your plan of salvation, you invite Jesus to be Lord of your life, what Jesus said in in John chapter 12, verse 46, what he said about his whole mission, he said, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I've come as a light to shine in this dark world. And we've noticed it's gotten darker haven't we? So that anyone who puts their trust in me, not in their own plan of salvation, not in their own way to fix themselves, they no longer have to remain in that dark. Listen to me very, very carefully. If you hear nothing else I say tonight, there is a high cost to remaining in the dark. There is a high price to pay for going into 2022 remaining in in the dark of your own plan, of your own efforts, of your own attempt to fix yourself with whatever it is. We all wrestle with darkness outside of our control. 
And all of us have a plan for our own salvation from that. What's your darkness that you've wrestled with this past year in 2021? What is it for you? I'll go first. I'll tell you what it's been for me. Uh, This past year, well, in 2015, I was diagnosed with a form of cancer of which there is no um, official cure as of right now. So I was in remission for a period of time, and then in January of 2021, earlier this year, I found out that I was no longer in remission and I was going to have to go through uh, chemotherapy. And so I entered five months of chemotherapy starting in January. And man, God has been so good to me through that. There were, uh, it was hard. There were hard times. And man, our church family has been so good. Uh, you guys have loved us. And when I say things like, uh, you know, 20 years here, 20 Christmases with you at Frontline, uh, that is not lost on me. How, how blessed I am to be standing here with you tonight, to, to be with my family. But here's how the, that affects me the last year. Every single morning when I wake up, I'm in remission right now, and every single morning I wake up, and it, I would say within about 30 seconds of when I open my eyes, the thought comes into my head, how long? How long do I have in remission? It's like, a, it's like something that just sits right here on my shoulders like something that's pursuing me all the time. It's the darkness that just feels completely out of my control. And so over this last year, uh, in my worst moments, my plan to fix that, my plan to save myself from that has been uh, to obsessively Google everything I can to learn about the disease that I have, to learn about, uh, you know, possible treatments, all these things. I've lost hours at a time. I don't even know where they went, just sitting there obsessing and worrying and having anxiety and freaking out about all the things that might happen or might not happen. Because, because here's the lie. The, the thought is, if I can just understand it, if I can just read enough, if I can just find some piece of information, then I'll be able to control it. I'll be able to fix it somehow. And... What I've discovered this past year in a richer and deeper way than I've ever known in my life. I've known it in the past, but I know it to the core of my being. The anchor for my soul, the place where I've gone to find hope, the only real comfort I've found is that at some point in that morning, after that thought pops into my head, every morning I sit down in the same chair and I open up the word of God and I just begin to ask God to speak to me, and I, and I apply the gospel message, what we've just been talking about tonight, the reason Jesus came, and when I begin to apply the gospel message to, to that darkness in my head, and I begin to apply the gospel message in prayer, what, what happens is Jesus meets me in that. I can't explain it, but he does. And, and what he reminds me, and what I can sit here and tell you tonight, is that my hope is, is not, you know, Jesus didn't come into this world to fix trials and sorrows. What the gospel tells us is Jesus came to end trials and suffers, suffering once and for all. My hope is not that he will fix my sickness. My hope is in the fact that he has ended all sickness and death once and for all, for all of eternity. And that is real hope, my friends. That is a hope that is an anchor for your soul. That is a hope that will see you through any darkness. It's true light. And so I, I, what I wanna do tonight is I wanna just say to you, he wants to be the light for you and your life so that you don't remain in the darkness. I'm gonna put a prayer up here on the screen. Jesus wants to be the light for you. So you don't have to remain in the darkness of the addiction in 2022. He wants to be the light for you so you don't remain in the darkness of the endless need to perform so that you have value. So that you don't have to remain in the darkness of the trap of beauty 
the trap of trying to, to fix yourself with something, with, whether it be a substance, whatever it is, so that you no longer remain in the dark. That's why Jesus came. He is a savior and he really is that good. So here's what I wanna do. I just wanna um, in, invite you to pray this prayer with me. It's actually more of a confession than a prayer. Romans 10 says to us, the way we plug into the light, it says, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we are saved. The power source from the outside comes in and, and he becomes the light with, by which we live, not our own plan. So would you bow your heads with me? For some of you, this is the, maybe the first time you've ever done this. Maybe you've known the story. You've heard the story before. But this is the first time you're ever actually saying now, for me personally. For other, others of you, maybe you did this at one time in your life, but then you turned away, you walked away. And so what you're saying tonight is, Jesus, I'm coming back home. I'm coming back to you the true light. I'm putting my faith and my trust in you. So would you pray this with me if, this, if that's you tonight? Jesus, I put my trust in you, the true light, that I may no longer remain in darkness. I confess you as Lord and light of my life. I ask you to forgive me and give me life abundantly in you. And in Jesus' name, we all said, amen. My friends, if you just prayed that prayer and if you truly meant it, whether you're watching online or whether you're here listening to the sound of my voice right here in this room, if, if you did that and you truly meant it, what we believe is that you just got saved. You just plugged into the power source for all of eternity for your life, to the true hope that is real hope that our world can't offer. And so we are the church and it's Christmas and we celebrate things like that. We celebrate when people go from darkness to light. And so uh, we're gonna do something symbolic uh, right now in the room to celebrate that decision, to celebrate people going from darkness to light. And so if you just prayed that prayer, I'd love for you to grab this card. Um, it's right there. There's a little bit, a light bulb that's in there. That's uh, for everybody. You can pop that out and take it home. It's just a way of remembering this service. But if you prayed that prayer tonight, if, if you trusted Jesus with your life, I'd love for you, even as I'm talking right now, grab a pen. They're all in the seats. And just give us, fill out your name, and then just give us either your email or your phone number, and then whether or not this was a first-time commitment for you or whether this was a recommitment, the first time doing this or, or a coming back home to do this. And then here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand and we're going to sing a couple of songs together. And what I want you to do is when you've got that card filled out, I want you to make your way into the aisles. And you'll notice in the aisles, there are these strands of light and there are these white boxes. They look like Christmas presents over here in all the different aisles. And so what I want you to do is um, as we're singing, I want you to come and drop this card in the box. And then what I want you to do is uh, turn one of the light bulbs on the strand so it'll come on. Uh, screw, righty tighty, okay, everybody? Instructions. <laughs> And when that light bulb comes on, that's a symbolic way of saying your life, you're not just carrying around a dead light bulb anymore. The light of Jesus Christ has entered your life now and for all of eternity, and you are living by that light now. And so we're gonna light this place up in the room and celebrate new life in Christ. That's what we're gonna do. So will you stand? Stand to your feet right now. If you prayed that prayer, if you did that, fill out that card right now and begin, even as we're singing right now, begin making your way into the aisle and uh, let's celebrate, let's do this. Jesus redeems people. He brings us from darkness to light.